I'm Aaron Sagers, and this is Talking Strange. Okay, Megan Suri, uh, the star of It Lives Inside. I've seen the movie a couple times now, and I was fortunate to talk to your director, Bischel, back at San Diego Comic-Con, and excited to be talking to you. I wanted to start off with, this is quite a, a big role for you to be taking on, and I was curious, you're dealing, your character is dealing with isolation as a teen, very relatable, isolation as an immigrant, and then you add to that this uh, haunted trifecta of isolation as a young woman who might be seen as crazy, but also dealing with a demonic force. <laughs> so, My girl Sam is going through it, for sure. <laughs> <doubt> about that. <laughs> well, what did you relate to within this role? Uh, hopefully not the demonic uh, hauntings. <laughs> I think uh, aside from the demonic hauntings, I think pretty much everything else was something that I either had a direct connection to or a direct experience with or a similar shared experience with, which was part of the allure and I think immediate connectivity that I had with Bishop when we were speaking about this. And I, I just, I knew from a sort of intrinsic level uh, the feelings that Sam was feeling um, as in, in, in those circumstances. And I've read that you were, you are a fan of horror movies. Is, is this correct? This is very correct. <laughs> what's, what's makes up your horror movie DNA? What are some of the flicks that you really love or TV shows? Ooh, uh, I mean, I, well, the first movie that I remember seeing as a child that stuck with me and, uh, was like a real, moment for me was Jeepers Creepers. That was sort of the first I think I ever saw, but ones that I would add to my sort of horror favorite list would be um, a huge fan of The Strangers. Um, there's a sleeper horror, horror, horror film that I, it's not as mainstream, but I think it, it definitely deserves to be a uh, vacancy. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Um, huge vacancy fan. I like The Collector. I recently loved Barbarian that came out not too long ago. That was a fun one. Um, definitely the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. I mean, I mean, the list just goes on for me, honestly, but those are some of the more immediate ones that come to mind. Well, we've been seeing a nice evolution of women characters and horror films that are, even though they're dealing with these trials and tribulations, they're not the damsels in distresses and certainly not helpless. Are there any horror, uh, women horror protagonists that you would like Sam to kind of be within the category of, like to be compared to? Ooh, that's a that's such a great question. Uh, and, I, and I'm so glad that horror is one of those genres where I do think that we do see more powerful female leads, which I think is so important. Um, it's, it's tricky because It Lives Inside is really, even though there are some very traditional horror elements that this movie is inspired by, it is definitely one of its own. And I mean, definitely its own of its kind. So it's tricky to see where I see Sam falling into that. I would love to think that Sam could hold her own in this world of horror. That would be awesome. But um, if I had to pick, I mean, Sydney Prescott from the Scream series, like that, that's, she's so iconic in so many ways. And she survived every movie like that's awesome um and one of the more immediate ones that come to mind but hopefully it lives inside can make its own mark <laughs> you know i don't i don't know if they they probably didn't communicate this but in addition to being an entertainment journalist i'm a big fan and and professionally i talk a lot about folklore and supernatural and paranormal and yeah it's it's a weird kind of side thing that i'm known for and so i'm i'm familiar with these stories of the pishash um but i'm i'm curious are you finding audiences are ready to expand their cultural knowledge with regards to folklore and the supernatural and even demons i mean i can only hope that that's sort of what they take from it what i have heard some people, even some of the journalists who have interviewed us, um, which is really awesome to hear is that after the movie has ended, they've gone and researched the Pashash and they're researching the mythology behind it, which is sort of, I think, 
part of the goal of, of making something like this is you can only hope, especially when it's a different cultural experience in your own, um, it's something that you're interested enough to want to delve deeper into. But that's so cool that, you know, this is like what you do. I feel like we need to have more conversations about this. <laughs> It makes sense to me. It makes sense because we have, I don't know, like 5 million Indians and Indian Americans living in the United States. And when people grow up with a certain belief system or from a certain culture or move to this country, they are still bringing that lore with them. And it's fascinating to think that, you know, the the the, the entities follow, follow the people that are immigrating and growing up here. They, they kind of make the jump across the pond as well. Absolutely. And I mean, they st they've stood the test of time. I mean, India has existed for so long. So for the stories to continuously be passed down, I mean, hey, there has to be some truth to them. I don't know what it is, but it's definitely something that I think is what why horror is, is such an under, it shouldn't be, but it is such an underappreciated genre for that reason is maybe people don't necessarily want to talk about these things that are uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, I mean, to the credit of, of uh, companies such as Neon and A24, it seems like the kind of the literacy of, of these things is expanding. For you, my understanding is that you, grew, you were born in the U.S. and then you moved to India for two years, two and a half years, and then you came back here, correct? Yes, correct. So, were there stories of these entities for you when you were growing up? Was this a part of your upbringing? Unfortunately, but also fortunately, they were not. I, I didn't grow up. I didn't grow up with any particular stories that I remember from specific entities. Um, simply because I was going to school six days a week. I don't think I even had time. And even if my grandma did tell me them, I was probably too tired to listen. <laughs> um, but um, it's definitely been something that I, my, my grandma certainly told me her own actual accounts of experiencing paranormal activity. And those stuck with me. And, and those I remember very much so scared the shit out of me or crap out of me. I'm sorry. Um, and even my dad used it as a tactic or a ploy to, to, to get us to go to sleep as kids, um, threatening us with like, if you don't go to sleep, well, then this, this monster is going to come and get you. Uh, so it was, it, they were in my life, but not in the same way where I think Bishel was able to create a literal piece of work out of it. Well, you got to tell me what, what were some of the stories from your grandmother or even from your father that stuck with you and scared the shit slash crap out of you? <laughs> well, my grandma, there was one story I remember her telling us about the house that we, we lived in while I was living in India about how there was a tenant that she had just recently allowed to live in the home. And I remember her saying like, I, it, it was something along the lines of uh, there were peanuts or there was like food that she had left out. And there's a door that connected the tenant's place to ours. My grandma always locked it. And she was saying how I think they'd had some kind of a disagreement or some kind of an argument of some kind. And the next morning when she woke up, um, she noticed that that food was gone, but the door was still completely locked and untouched. My grandma had a freakier way of explaining it, but it was just as a child trying to fathom how someone was able to like go through this door and who knows did what else, but there was literal tangible evidence of something being gone really struck a real like fear chord in me. And I was freaked out from that point uh, to say less. Never than this, I never really wanted to argue with my grandma after that either. <laughs> Anything that your dad told you to, uh, to scare you straight? My dad was very generic. His whole thing was, and I'm not even sure, maybe you actually know this since this is like what you do, but he called it the babutola. I don't think it's actually a real thing. It sounds like the Babadook, but um, he would say often to us, like, if you don't go to sleep, the babutola is going to come and get you. And that was enough for all my siblings to be like, okay, it's time to go to sleep. Lights out. No more playing around. Um, so I've got to actually ask him if like, what was that even about dad? I'm sure my dad has plenty of stories for sure. Uh, how old were you when you went back to India? I would say I was about 
five years old. I was there from about five to seven and a half. Yeah, that sounds okay. about right. So, I mean, pretty young. So this might be a, a difficult question to answer, but based on your experience, do you think that there's a different level of, um, I guess, I don't want to say spiritualism, but almost like different levels of willingness to accept the supernatural between you know, some of the kids that you grew up with in the U.S. versus the kids or adults you were around in India? I think so. Um, I mean, superstitions, superstitions are so, so prevalent in Indian culture specifically, and even ones that, you know, we, we've had. And so I think that that overall culture of superstitions really ties into the supernatural and I think that that's, that's sort of just woven throughout India as a whole, certainly in South Asian culture, I'm sure as well. Um, but yeah, I think that um, India, I just recently talked to a journalist and she put it in such beautiful terms. India is such an ancient country and it's got such a rich history. And so I think that when you're met with a country that's a little bit younger or quite younger than India, um, those sort of traditions and values and what you're scared of and and the unknown are a lot more rooted in than the sort of stories that I think are now just generating in a very young country like the U.S. It, yet also it makes it sure perhaps more enrich, enriching in many ways because it is such an ancient culture and belief a series of belief systems uh, but it also can make it quite scarier because Honestly, like now the the kind of monsters that we're used to, we become so used to in horror, Western horror, it's yeah, it's relatively uh recent, you know, evils <laughs> as opposed to like <laughs> something that's like an old ancient evil where it's like, well, we really don't want know what the hell to do with this. Absolutely. I mean that that is that is part of I mean, the huge terror is like, how do you destroy something or how do you confront something that's lived for so long? Clearly it knows what it's doing and no one's been able to stop it. Uh, so yeah, there, there, there is that real elemental fear. Yeah. And it's, you know, with, with a, the predominant amount of um, American horror, or Western horror, when it deals with demons, it's like, it's typically Christian and Catholic based of, and I was raised Catholic. So it's like, I had my fill of, you know, I knew what you did. You call the priest, holy water, you do a couple of incantations, bing, bang, boom, it's done, it's taken care of. But this kind of opens up this whole new world and that's out of our depth, which is cool, but is it, it's also got to be exciting for you that, you know, other Indian Americans out there can see these stories that it's like, okay, this isn't just, you know, Christian based, just, you know, calling a priest and use holy water. Sure, absolutely. Um, that's what's exciting. I think especially just in general right now, I think what audiences are, I mean, maybe I'm just speaking from my own personal perspective, but I definitely think that part of what's made movies exciting again is that we're so desperately looking for just new, fresh takes on something, um, in the, you know, in the culture of reboots and, and, and all of that, I think what we're just hoping for is some real creativity. And so it's nice to be able to delve into something as iconic as horror, but, you know, add in a little fresh element for, for, for audiences to hopefully grip their teeth into and something new to be scared of. So on set of a, of a horror movie, I find typically you know, when you're dealing with a certain kind of topic, it just generates conversation about that topic amongst the cast, sometimes, and maybe not always. So I was curious, like you and your cast, did it lead to conversations about superstitions, about what's out there, uh, you know, potential evils or other things? Did you guys chat about this at all? I wish, and maybe if there's a second it lives inside too, maybe that's what we'll talk about more often, but I feel like we were all just such goofballs on set and <laughs> like most of my scenes were with um mohano or or and i feel like also part of just being in the movie for like 95 percent of it is that i never really got to have a lot of downtime <laughs> it was just mostly like go 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 sleep 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 um but i think also when you're working on a horror movie the way to get through it especially when you're dealing with such layered emotions and such dark intense emotions every day like the only way for us to make it 
enjoyable and off of set not that it's not when you're in it it's so fun but when you're off of set it's like the last thing that you want it's like when you get off of work not even the last thing you want to do is talk about work but this is definitely something that I feel like I will especially upon speaking to you like I'm I'm more interested in this more than ever now and um yeah I, I hope that we get to maybe do a second one did you <laughs> it's a job and yeah you you know you're focused on a performance and then you rap and you're exhausted because you did do so much uh screen time on this but still sometimes this stuff bleeds over into your unconscious mind the the theme of nightmares is a recurring one in the in the film did you have dreams did you have nightmares did you you know hear any strange noises noises in your uh, place at night you know we and this is one thing that's actually I'm really glad that I get to talk about this right now because I didn't even think about this until now but it, for certain movies when they're especially like when we're dealing with the more demonic aspects of it whether it's playing with the Ouija board or whether it's like calling upon a spirit i feel like like in the conjuring for example i think that in those aspects it probably would have lingered with you for quite some time but going back to the sort of religious aspect of this movie everything that samita or sam was chanting whether it was looking through the book and the diary um it was all positive Hindu um, chants. And so I always, in the back of my head, when I get freaked out by things, I was like, at least I wasn't calling upon something. I was saying something spiritual and positive out into the world. And I definitely think that that had a play, but we did have two different sets of scenarios where um, stuff started to go wrong. And it was very weird and a little too coincidental for it. And it freaked everyone out for a slight minute. Um, like for example, um, on Betty Gabriel's day of filming, the mirror shattered. It was just random, just randomly it shattered. And then the second day we had a house behind our set catch on fire. And seven is a huge theme in this movie. And I was trying to get everyone to jump on the train of like, there's gonna be seven things that happen. And this is, we're on day two and it was happening consistently. And well, we only ended up to two, but I was hopeful that, whoa, I'm having a, I'm having a horror experience right now coming to life. <laughs> the um uh, you know Bishel is like such an enthusiastic director and I I know yeah. he has ideas for sequels and you know like any good horror movies I don't think it's spoiling anything to say that there's there's material that could lead it lead into a sequel did he talk to you at all about some of the other things that could be explored uh through Sam or through this universe Absolutely. I mean, he has, but I, I really want audiences to have their own fresh take. And, and hopefully, depending on the reception of this, we'll be able to delve into and it lives inside too. But um, it'll be a fun one. And it might, actually, I shouldn't say anything, but it would definitely be something very cool. And it would also, and maybe you could catch on to this after, but it would be the only way to, to potentially defeat um, the Pishash. So might mean going somewhere else. Mm. Um, that's all I'll say. <laughs> okay. And then um, just for you, outside of like stories that your grandmother or your, your dad told you, were there any kind of, you know, where, like, let's say primarily in the US, since that's where you spent most of your time growing up, any kind of urban legends or spooky houses at the end of the street or, you know, the, the bridge, crybaby bridge, any kind of lore like that? where you grew up that you recall? Unfortunately, I was born and raised in Downey, California. And the most, the oldest thing that we have going on about our town is that we have like one of the world's oldest standing McDonald's. So there's really, there's no bridges. There's no cool spooky houses. Um, I wish I did. I feel like that would have been so, uh, it would have added so much more personality. <laughs> To just where I grew up but it's it's very much so just a suburbia which is like what Sam lives in and another connection that I had to Sam yeah probably an old McDonald's that's haunted though uh, <laughs> hey, I wouldn't doubt it <laughs> and uh you know for if if we were to see Sam again and without you know without spoiling or showing your cards or anything would you be interested in picking up Sam sort of the day after or a couple days later, or would you be interested in pursuing this character, you know, down the road as, as maybe she's more of a, more of a war weary 
uh, hero, you know, that's that's fighting monsters and demons. Yeah, I think I think the latter lends itself to be a little bit more interesting just to see, you know, how it's affected her day to day life um, and how she's navigated through that, I think, could be more interesting. And also just as I age, I think it's it might be a little bit easier for me to just from a physical standpoint, jump into a, a slightly older Samita as opposed to the teenager that we see currently. Yeah. I'm thinking Ripley here. I'm thinking, you know, Ooh. badass demon hunter, uh, Samita. Yeah. Which was certainly Bishel's inspiration, by the way, that was a huge point of inspiration for him. So I'm glad that you say that. Yeah. I mean, look, there's a lot of lore, like the, uh, Nishi Doc comes to mind, you know, this other entity. I mean, that's the beauty about Indian culture and South Asian culture too, is that there's just there it's it's so diverse and there are so many stories. And I truly hope that it lives inside is really just we you know just really a door that's opened up, hopefully, um the opportunity to explore more of those incredibly interesting, terrifying stories. What's you know, just because Cinema is such a difficult and fickle thing right now. Overall, it's, it's challenging across the entertainment industry. But what would you say is like, what, what's kind of your pitch to get audiences out there, get those butts in in theater, in seats in theaters? Oh man, wish I was a better pitcher. Uh, I think that, well, for me personally, like cinema was a way and has always been a way for me to connect to either different relationship experiences, different dynamics that I have not experienced, understanding someone else's perspective. Uh, and that certainly relates to, um, to, to, to cultural awareness. I mean, Bong Joon-ho even said in his infamous speech about how the, the, the caliber of movies that we can see will be elevated if we just get past the barrier of subtitles, right? And so I think that rings true. So I feel like it lives inside is really just lending itself as first of its own and, and an opportunity to explore um, a terrifying take into a culture that otherwise we don't see enough of. So if you're interested in hopefully expanding your horizons and expanding your um, perspective on life and about the people that we, we, we live closely with, I would, I would say it lives inside is a great way to, to delve into that and also just deal with your own. It's not, yes, it is centered around a Brown family, but there are, I think, elements from each character or even just one that I think can resonate with really just about anyone from any walk of life. Well, I know we're one winding down on time, but I'll just throw this out there. I mean, yes, it's, it's about, uh, different kind of entities and evils and all that and it's exciting but it's also just squarely a teen horror movie and it fits within this classic teen horror movie genre along with everything else so if you're gonna pitch like a dream double feature it lives inside with what classic teen horror flick oh man i feel like just to play homage to bishop scream is one of his favorites up there but also it could be i would say because so much of the inspiration in this film was pulled um from a nightmare on elm street so i think that those movies could be a fun one too because it deals with the same concepts and the same topics of like what is real and is what i'm seeing real and do will people believe me will they think i'm crazy and um Freddy Krueger was actually definitely one of those movies that he, that character in general was something that kept me from sleeping at night, obviously. So I think that's a good one to add to the roster. For sure. When you're, when you're <laughs> most vulnerable sleeping and, uh, and the parents can't help really. The parent, no one can help. You yeah. Figure it out. <laughs> well, uh, Megan, I know we're out of time. I just want to say again, I really enjoyed the film. I, you know, I think it just, it's a great entry in the horror franchise, horror genre, and it's also a fresh one. So uh, best of luck with this. I watched it twice. Can't wait to check it out in cinemas. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that.